and there will be some available afterwards uh, for purchase and Ian will be signing copies. Um, just to introduce Ian, for those of you who need an introduction, Ian is Professor of Psychology at Trinity College Dublin and he was the founding director of the Trinity College Institute of Neuroscience and he is currently a director of the Global, of the, um, Global Brain Health Institute. Is it? Great. Um, uh, Ian is, uh, has a great combination of both clinical insights from his work as a clinical psychologist and also um, scientific insights from his work as a cognitive neuroscientist. And I think he just brings an intense curiosity to the field, which helps too. Um, as I say, the, the new book is The Stress Test. Uh, it covers, I think, not only stress, but a lot of different aspects of how we can, how we can use our brains a bit better. And we'll be picking Ian's brain about that now. Um, and I think it's written in a very engaging style as well. I was, as I was reading it, I was thinking, this is kind of like Malcolm Gladwell meets Oliver Sacks, <laughs> but better, of course. If only. If only. <laughs> so the format this evening, um, myself and you are going to have a quick chat here, um, and uh, we will be welcoming questions from the audience as well. So if you have any questions for Ian about how we can use our brains better, um, please do uh, uh, chime in, just stick your hands up, and wait for a microphone, because we do have a live feed um, to the internet, and they won't hear you if you don't have the microphone. So. Um, Ian, I suppose maybe if I can start off by asking you, uh, why write a book at this point about stress? Well, first of all, thank you, Claire. It's a delight to be interviewed by you, a uh, great science uh, journalist and activist for science, which is great. So why did I write it? Well, I, um, I worked as a, 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 a psychiatric nursing assistant in, in New Zealand and uh, uh, I had previously, to go, going there, I'd, I'd been in Fiji as doing voluntary service overseas as a teacher. and There wasn't much to read there, and I came across a book by Nietzsche. And I remember reading, I remember it stuck in my mind reading, uh, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And that kind of, I'm a kind of optimistic guy, and I kind of liked that. I liked that notion that, you know, bad things could have a good side to them. Um, and then when I worked in New Zealand, uh, I was very struck by the, um, in the psychiatric hospital, just the, the heavily, it was a heavily medicalized, hugely medicalized, everyone, a huge number of people got ECT for all sorts of problems. This is electroconvulsive therapy. Yeah, you know, yeah, electroconvulsive therapy. And then there was another, but one of the other psychiatrists ran <clears throat> a day hospital, and he, he um, almost never gave ECT, and he ran much more of a therapeutic community. And so I, I was very exposed I mean, just done a degree in psychology, I was exposed to this, two models for approaching psychological distress, one very, very medical and one very, very psychological. And um, I, I, I was a bit kind of confused what was going on here and what was happening. And so then I, I went, I was very fortunate, I went to the Institute of Psychiatry in London, in London to, to do clinical psychology. And there I was, again, there was that kind of split personality of the institution. I was in the psychology department where we were being taught behavior therapy largely, um, which is a very, very effective method, for, particularly for treating things like phobias and obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, but it was purely psychological. Whereas there was a wonderful institution, all these psychiatrists and biochemists working on the chemistry of the brain and uh, doing glamorous things. And so there was these two competing models of, uh, of, of the brain, the psychological and the, and the, and the biological, if you like. Um, and so I kind of fell into the trap of, of the glamour of the whole biological. It became kind of quite of what I thought was hard-minded, tough-minded about, you know, oh yeah, all this psychology stuff. You know, really, it's particularly the, the twin studies that were tending to show um, have a lot of heritability of some of these problems, and all the psychiatric assessments where family history was huge. You know, and so um, this felt too almost soft to you, did it? Yeah, the psychology <laughs> felt kind of. Uh, you know, because I, I am, I, am a, I, I suffer, I guess, from physics envy, I, you know, the hard <laughs> sciences and, the, you know, the kind of proper, precise, psychology is not nearly as precise yet as a science, um, you know, as, as the biological. And here are these, I went out with a neuro, a Chilean neurochemist for a while, and she, nice. kind, of, she kind of made me feel, ooh, you know, you're, you're doing soft <laughs> stuff, you know, remember, <laughs> Anyway, it didn't last long with so this, the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. The, the biology then was more like the bricks and mortar of the brain that yeah, you were getting right. used in, in at that's that point. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I was very persuaded schizophrenia, you know, that's largely a disease of the, you know, um, and, and, 
you know, I remember scorning a psychologist who was talking about doing psychotherapy with schizophrenics, you know, and I was thinking, that's ridiculous. I'd, so I fell in. So then, um, and, and so uh, I, I kind of went to Edinburgh and uh, I worked um, in a, 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 I eventually got a job in a rehabilitation hospital with exactly the same split. You know, I remember going in and people were, had strokes and head injury and there was this big team of therapists and rehabilitation doctors working with them and, and doing all this stuff. And I remember asking one of the doctors, give me a textbook on rehabilitation so I can understand what you're all doing here. And it was all, it was a book about wheelchairs and walking sticks and spasticity. And I realized there was no theory for what they were doing. Um, except that medical model again. Really, the brain is repairing itself. And what we're doing is really preventing the muscles getting spastic. And there, there was, the therap even though the main activity was by therapists, they didn't have a model for what they were doing. So I was a bit confused and a bit, a bit to be frank, a bit demoralized about psychology. And I was also lecturing in Edinburgh. And I was lecturing, you know, the brain is not a muscle. Once dead, a brain cell does not regenerate. Uh, so all this nonsense of, of, you know, that you can stimulate the brain and the, all the great, that was the that prevailing was the orthodoxy. Yeah. And Kayal had said that, the great Nobel Prize winning physiologist, Luria, the great neuropsychologist, have said, no, the brain can only, you can only work around the, the damage, you can't do anything. So, and I was feeling a bit kind of, God, I'm in the right field at all, because I did suffer from this kind of hard science envy. And then uh, the sky fell in one day. The sky fell in. Um, a, guy called, a guy called Michael Merzenich, who uh, was in, he was in the University of California, San Francisco. And um, he published this paper showing that, you know, this was in the monkey, the adult, the adult monkey brain changed according to environmental stimulation. OK. So this is at odds with the thought that our brains were, were just fixed. Yeah. And they couldn't change. Yeah. That's what we're, we were, what I learned was that up until, you, your brain was plastic up until the age of five. Mm -hmm. After that, it wasn't plastic anymore. And basically, you were in the downward hill of your brain cells dying. Nice. <laughs> and um, uh, so, um, and, and, and so I, I kind of thought, oh, wow, that's, that's that, you know, the ramifications of this are incredible. And then, then a guy called Alvaro Pascual Leone in, in Harvard wonderful Spanish uh, neurologist, he showed that um, Braille readers, adult Braille readers who learn Braille when they were reading, that the, the, the part of the brain responding to the right fingertip, that part of the brain expanded okay, as so a result of that stimulation. Yeah. So suddenly it's been shown in humans. And then I thought, ah, yeah, but, but um, OK, but still basically these things, it's, it's basically determined by genetics, a lot of the major disorders, maybe not so much some of the softer psychological ones, but things like schizophrenia. And then I discover, uh, I discover a paper comes out saying that, uh, okay, you can't change the genetic, the DNA, uh, with environmental stimulation, but you can switch genes on and off. So the proteins they produce. Which is, of course, what causes the function. Which causes the function mm -hmm. of the genes. So we only have 23,000 roughly genes. They can't possibly code for all the different behaviors and personality. and They can't possibly. And so I realized we were, you know, I read and realized we evolved to be changed by the environment. That's what being human is. And suddenly the, the world opened. Suddenly the, all possibilities of reconciling this split personality between the, um, the hard, the biological determinism and this kind of soft psychology suddenly all came together. And it came together in my head, I realized, um, with a, a discovery by a psychologist in 1949 in McGill University in Montreal. It was a discovery that revolutionized physiology. And that was Donald Hebb and his proposal, this principle of cells that fire together, wire together. Right. So suddenly we had, the, and, and, and with Tim Bliss in London, Marina Lynch, my colleague, her mentor, had discovered the mechanism of cells that fire together, wire together, which is called long-term potentiation. So it means if you get two cells to fire together, a functional connection or a physical connection will eventually grow between them. Mm -hmm. So that was the mechanism by which all this experience 
change physically shaped the brain. So in 1999, I ended up writing a book called Mind Sculpture, which was about this revelation to me. And, um, you know, I'd been working until then as a clinical psychologist, but this kind of biological fatalism, I think, had undermined my effectiveness as a therapist. Okay. I kind of, you know, someone would come into you and you can back of your mind and say, oh, really, this is, you know, this is, this is really medical. It's not, it's not as biological. It's, you know, the psychology can't really do much about this. So, so I think, um, so I, I can, the, the book is about me looking, part of the book is me looking back in some of my cases mm -hmm. that I saw when I was a job in clinical psychologist about what I know now about the brain. Right, and so saying, you can see how it makes sense. In yeah, the yeah, and what, whether, what, what would I have done now? When, nice. You know, what would I do now if I was doing, what, seeing these people again? Okay. And, and you, make the, you, you draw the analogy as well <coughs> between software and hardware. Hmm. So we're all familiar with the computer that is yeah. being a bit sluggish, or yeah. the phone that's getting a bit glitchy. Yeah. And yeah. If you upgrade the software, yeah. well, the hardware works better then. Yeah, yeah. So similarly in the brain? Well, yes. I mean, it is like that. So um, it, so sometimes, well, I know, I know we're going to talk later on about the emotions. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to yeah. talk about that Fire. now? So, uh, okay, uh, about t t t three months, two, two and a half months ago, I had a beating heart, um, <coughs> I sweaty hope it's still hands. Beating, Ian. <laughs> still beating, fastly beating heart, <laughs> swiftly beating, a very pounding heart, dry mouth, sweaty hands. Do you mind what emotion did I, was I having? Anybody guess? Just fear, yeah. Fear, fear, yeah. No, 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 no. Ireland had just scored against Sweden. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> it's excitement. Okay. Now, the, sim the physical sympathetic nervous system activation of excitement, is it, the symptoms are identical in anxiety. And one of the most famous experiments in psychology was um, the the, the Sch Schachter and Singer experiment, famous, famous experiment, where they got people into a waiting room and there was stooges, stooge, there was a stooge in there, and apparently another person waiting to do the psychology experiment, and they had to fill out these enormous forms like psychologists do. And you know, they, got, they got the ethical approval to inject adrenaline into these people. So they had these non-specific symptoms like I had had, beating heart, etc. But they they, 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 um, they told the, the, the groups to expect um, different symptoms so that they weren't, there was no expect, they didn't know they'd they been given the yeah, yeah, things like sweaty feet and things like that. But anyway, and so half of them were in, the, 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 the stooge mate in the waiting room was someone who was bad tempered and irritated and uh, what's this nonsense and behaving in an impatient, angry way. The other one was a good-natured, laughing, joking one. And what they found was, the, and then they got the people to they assess their emotion afterwards in this state of arousal. And the people that had been with the good-natured person and in, interpreted these non-specific symptoms as being ones of good humor and excitement and, you know, at, at the, at, and, and laughter, whereas the other ones ex interpreted them as being another type of arousal, which is anger. And then there was another experiment where they, they got a young woman to assess young men on a swinging bridge in, near Vancouver, 400 feet above the, the, wa the water, and they asked them to, to write a short story uh, about anything uh, on the bridge. And then they did the same in a stable bridge. Uh, up, and they found that the swinging bridge generated a whole lot of sexual content in the stories because they had these the, 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 the swinging bridge was causing these arousal symptoms, but because they were with a young woman, um, they, 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 their brain interpreted them as sexual excitement, which is, again has similar, very similar set of. Uh, and so, if you want, if you fancy someone, if you fancy <laughs> someone, um, get them, take them on a, a, a fair, terrifying fairground ride, <laughs> and there's a lot of studies showing after that they're more likely to interpret the, the, the fear of the symptoms as being attraction, so you're more likely to get off with them, <laughs> uh, or Talk get them you. after they've been to the gym, oh. because similarly, the arousal symptoms, now if they don't like you, it will exaggerate the dislike, right. <laughs> so it can go either way. <laughs> you fail fast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
So yeah, I mean that that is that is a case of, of context being king, isn't it? And also are the brain's adaptability, yeah. I suppose, in yeah. terms oh, yeah. where we're we're making good use of the signals that are yeah. there yeah. combined with the context. Yeah. That's right. And so um, there's a, an experiment done in uh, the, the Walton Business School, the Wharton, the Wharton Business School in Philadelphia, where they get um, people to do a, a very stressful situation. They have to present, do mental arithmetic in front of an audience, and uh, they monitor their heart rate, and their heart rate is, is, is portrayed to them, boom, 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 in front. They see what their heart rate is. Um, but the only piece of those is a Two groups do this. One get one piece of software code in their brain and one get another. What's the software code? One group have to say before they do this, I feel anxious, which is true. The other group have to say out loud to themselves, I feel excited. The ones that I say I feel excited not only end up feeling better, but they perform better on the, on the, on the, on the sums. And they had to do other things like uh, sing songs accurately, and they were more accurate. So just that little rewriting of the cognitive software changed the entire emotion, uh, because the symptoms are so general that they're common to anger, to excitement, to anxiety, and to sexual arousal. The common set of symptoms, and they com people confuse them all the time, and get a, 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 and so my if, if there was any one reason for writing this book is to persuade people that we have control over the most complex entity in the known universe, which is our own brain. Very good. Um, yeah, because, because a, a key theme throughout the book is that people respond to stress in different ways. Yeah. And that you have seen people in your clinical practice, who, uh, some of whom have fallen apart <laughs> at relatively minor stresses, yeah. and others who've experienced horrendous things, yeah. but gone on to be stronger yeah. from it. That's right. So I start the book with uh, Lucy and Peter, and Lucy's um, they were both uh, students that were referred to me in Edinburgh, and um, Lucy, I, was, I remember her big black uh, bags under her, her shadows under her eye and um, eyes, and she'd been stopped going to lec missing lectures and her, you know social life at curtail, and I so I thought oh there must be something terrible here, and it ended I couldn't find anything really wrong in her life, except she'd failed an exam. In her, in her second year, I think, failed an exam. And she, she had, she had, that was the first time she'd ever experienced failure. And uh, she just went to pieces. And it didn't take long to get her back. But, but um, there was another guy, Peter, who was referred also because he was missing lectures. And um, it turns out he was missing lectures because he's, he, he had to take a job because his, his mother he died of cancer. His father had been nursing her, fell apart and, and was drinking. And he was trying to... He was, became the, you know, looking after his 14-year-old sister and uh, minding things at home. But he, 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 compl he responded completely different to the objectively far more stressful situation from being a very laid back, you know, drinking in the beer bar in Edinburgh University. He decided he wanted to study medicine. He was going to convert his degree to medicine. And so that, these stress situations turned him around. And it was just this incredible difference in, in uh, you know, it was kind of, well, if Nietzsche, if Nietzsche's, you know, statement was correct. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. You know, why doesn't it apply to Lucy? And why did it apply to Peter? But uh, if Lucy was able to reprogram her she approach, was, though, she when was. it was drawn to her yes, attention. Yes, and that's, yeah. the, that's the great thing about cognitive behavior therapy, um, uh, which is that, you know, we can. It's, a, it's, it's about changing some of these lines of code, some of the assumptions you make, which drive our behavior and drive our physiology and produce all these symptoms that are then taken as <clears throat> by some people as symptoms of a biological disorder and then treated with you know biological uh, interventions like you know so you know the, the population of England is in 2013 was 53 million and um, there was 53 million prescriptions of antidepressants in that year in 2015 last year has gone up to 61 million which was a doubling since 2005, right. a doubling right. of prescriptions for antidepressants. 
So what on earth is going on there is, is what my question yeah, to myself no, no, was. They are, they are concerning statistics in the book. And you, yeah. I think you were drawing a comparison between how something like ECT, which is a very controversial yeah. uh, procedure, um, would have been used more in the past. Yeah. But now we're swinging more towards yeah. antidepressants. Yeah. So ECT, the, 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 the New Zealand hospital was a real blip um, in terms of the frequency it was mm -hmm. used. ECT was used very, very sparingly. And actually, if my elderly mother or father, if they were still alive, were in the kind of profound depression that I had to, I saw some people in, ECT can be a very effective method uh, for a small number of people, but for certainly not for the epidemic mm -hmm. of people getting antidepressants, mm -hmm. for sure. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that there can be no biological solutions for psychological problems, absolutely not. I'm just saying, uh, we need to pay. A, we need to be more confident about the extent to which our software can influence and, to some extent, control the biology. Of and it. maybe try those things as well as yes. or before. And yes, yes, that's same. right. Yeah. And 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 it's um, it's it's, it's beginning to happen. Uh, it happened in attention deficit disorder in children, where in America and Australia and Holland. I mean, I think in America it's up to. It may have changed, but in recent years it was up to one, one, in, one you know, there'd be a couple of two or three kids in every class, maybe even maybe one in ten kids on, on Ritalin. And, uh, you know, um, the, the, the British NICE guidelines for medicine, they came out about eight, eight years ago saying psychological treatment should be the, for, for moderate levels of ADHD should be the first line of defense. You should not give medication. It's the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. That's the one, yeah, yeah. that's okay. right. And, you know, uh, it, we're going to, I, I don't think it's good to have, to be using, to having the amount of prescription mm -hmm. of, um, of, of, of drugs for psychological problems. So let's talk about some of the things that, that you can do. I mean, one of your big areas of research is attention. Yeah. And quite often, I mean, you know, as we, as we get on in years, maybe we get a little bit forgetful, like where did I put my keys or did I lock the door? Did I leave the immersion on? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you, you were saying that, that some of that is a lack of attention rather than, a, than yeah. an actual memory issue. Yeah, that's right. But just generally, being able to control your attention is kind of a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. For two reasons. Um, so at, attention is a gateway. The contents of our consciousness are determined by what we attend to. Mm -hmm. um, and there's billions of bits of information outside our attention that we're not aware of. The, they, these can influence us through unconscious mechanisms. But in terms of our conscious life, the things that fill our mind, that, that is the gate of what we attend to determines that. And there's the two ways in which it's important. One is the, the plasticity of the brain that we talked about earlier, that Michael Mertznik demonstrated. He also showed that if you had a, a monkey who was, you, you were growing the finger part of the brain by having the monkey's finger stimulated by having it touch a rotating wheel with, with a raised edge. Not, not, not painful, just stimulating the brain through the finger. If you, if you got the, bunk, the monkey to attend to sounds mm -hmm. and got him rewarded for listening to target sounds, so he wasn't attending to the finger, you got no changes in the brain. Okay. So it needed the, the changes in the changes in the brain depended on attention. So that's that's generally uh, the tr the case that um, we don't learn what we don't attend to, and um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is um, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So if we let our mind go walk about without meaning it to, it will go, the mind hates unresolved conflicts. There's a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate that kind of sniffs them out. And it's always trying to resolve conflicts and, and worries, worries and, and, and problems are by definition unresolved conflict. And so the mind will, has this negative bias. If it's let off the leash like a puppy, it will sniff out trouble. So people who are poor at controlling their attention are more vulnerable to lower, having lower mood and more anxiety because 
of this negative bias of the, of the mind. Yeah, so so have, the, the, we, we have a test to measure this um, ability to pay attention called the SART. And it so happens a colleague in New Zealand was using it just before one of the earthquakes. Not the fatal earthquake, the, the previous one, this which was a huge one in Christchurch. Christ Christ That's right. And um, uh, so he found that he tested a whole lot of students and then he got them to do a questionnaire about how much they were emotionally disturbed by the earthquake, the extent to which they couldn't concentrate and, and, and were dis, you know, disrupted at work. And this, their performance on this my lab test predicted this really well. The Tell us about that test. What, do you have, what did they have to do? Well, I, well, I get them to do it now. Yeah? Are, are you all, are you you all mind? Okay. standing to attention? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I want you to clap, clap your hands to every number except the number three. Okay? So we'll go. Five, six, nine, eight, three, four, five, three, five, six, two, one, eight, nine, four, three, five. Okay. So it's, it's very hard to keep your mind on routine activities. I'm, I'm not very good at this test. I, it's, we, we, we called it the expletive test, but we, we, pub, <laughs> we published it as the oops test. And it's a very, very good, because the brain is programmed for novelty and change. And it very easily goes into automatic pilot. And that's why you can drive your car 100 miles and have no memory of it, because you've been thinking about what you're going to do when you get there. Mm -hmm. So you're an automatic pilot. And so it's that so the ability to override the automatic pilot and keep your mind on what you're doing turns out to be a huge protector, a huge protector against emotional disturbance. Okay. So, um, so if you're worried about stuff, if you're, you know, if the sad things have happened to you that you haven't, you know, that are plaguing you, your ability to just keep your mind and focus on the washing the dishes or focus on your work. And to, to control your to keep decide what where your attention is is one of the great antidotes to, to mood and anxiety problems. Okay, and and you found as well that you've been able to uh, to train people to sort of improve their own internal attention. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. with biofeedback. Tell yeah, us a little yeah, more about yeah. that. So we we this is the, the first started off with I was working in people who had strokes in the right hemisphere and and, and this this ability to pay attention. Uh, to override the automatic pilot and keep your mind on what you're doing depends on the right hemisphere of the brain. And it depends also on a chemical messenger called noradrenaline. And um, so the people with strokes in the right hemisphere have you know, they're, they're difficulty keeping their mind on what they're doing. So I, I remember a lady, Christine, who was in Cambridge, and uh, uh, I was kind of working on what to do because our, our, our daughters would come into her and they'd be having a conversation, and then they say the mother, she just drifted off. She yeah. wasn't listening, you know. And it's quite, yeah. you know, it was just, it was distressing for both of them. So um, they, uh, I just decided, you know, to uh, switch on her alertness because what happens is the arousal is going down, the noradrenaline levels are going down. So just clap my hands, you know, behind her, and she would kind of. You know, you didn't warn her. You're going to do it. Back in the room. She's yeah. back with you. That's called the orientation response. It's a natural response of the brain to an unexpected event. And I thought, well, can I? Well, suppose I can't go around getting people to clap their hands all the time. Is there any way we can do this? So I said, maybe we can teach her to do that ourselves. So we, we just developed a, a behavioural shaping program, where we got her to periodically do that to herself. You, and we didn't use biofeedback for that. We just got her to say focus, we get her to sit up straight as well, because that posture affects your uh, blood flow to the brain and your brain sit activity. <laughs> and we get to say that, we take a, get to take a deep breath, because that also, the bit of the brain that generates um, noradrenaline is called the locus ceruleus, and that's chemosensitive to carbon dioxide in the brain. Oh, okay. So you can modify, you, you, can, you can be your own drug dealer and change your own... <laughs> So when you slow down your breath, you're basically you're increasing the. the you're you're, you're regulating you're regulating mm -hmm. the level of noradrenaline in your brain, either up or down. Mm -hmm. In this case, you know, if you just try, take a deep breath just now. Sit up straight. I feel more alert. Does anyone else <laughs> feel more alert doing that? 
So she, so we taught her to control her own brain chemistry, and then we taught her a little routine, saying, "Well, give us a word that conveys alertness." So it's focus. I think she, I think she had wake up, wake up, wake up, Christy, wake up. So we then just trained her, got her to. The first week kind of cured her. Uh, we saw her drifting off. Do you do your routine, Christine? Wake up, and she'll be back with you. Yeah. And then, so then we said, well. We want you to do the, learn the habit of doing this yourself. So she, and then if she didn't do it over a fixed period, we reminded her, and she, and she would do it. So it became a what we call a metacognitive habit. It became a high-level habit to control her own brain. And we then did a study. We showed that this worked. It improved people's attention. It also improved their neglect, their left-sided neglect. And then we showed that we added biofeedback with, with, with people, adults with attention deficit disorder who have a similar right hemisphere problem. We trained them, but we added in biofeedback. We, the skin sweatiness reflects this arousal, the sympathetic activation. So we, we, we wired them up to a computer where they saw their skin sweatiness there. And I would <laughs> clap my hand behind the back and it would <laughs> see it go up. It takes about a second, you'll see it going up like that. So they would see their brain chemistry changing in front of their eyes. Right. And then say, do that yourself. Do it yourself. And so they'd learn that, and they'd find ways. So I'm, uh, I've just done it to myself. My pupil, you wouldn't have seen it, but my pupils would have dilated. So I can just do that on will. I can change my brain chemistry at will because I've learned this habit. And um, we, we did that then, did, we did it as a, a training program that they did themselves at home on the computer with the biofeedback. They, they learned to, they didn't, because this only works for a few seconds, but what they learned to do was to apply it to situations which they knew were problems for them. Before they were, because a big problem is memory, people you know, putting their glasses down and not remembering where they put them. So they'd, give, they'd, they'd learn to give themselves a little spike of that before they put their glasses down, which would help the memory encode. If they had to, you know, sometimes people were impulsive and inclined to be angry. If they felt that coming on, they would do, give themselves a little alert to, 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 to get their brain in, in shape so right. they could control their, their responses. Or if they were losing concentration in a meeting with their boss, they could do this without anyone seeing they were doing it. Because yeah. once you've learned it, you don't need the biofeedback anymore. Yeah. And we showed that over a randomized trial, three months later, these um, adults with attention deficit disorder, they were less depressed, they had less ADHD symptoms, they were better cognitive nice. functioning. So nice. it's kind of natural brain chemistry, and it yeah. was all to do with the software codes. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no medications required at all. Some of them were on medication, uh, but this was on top of it. This Some of them were not. Okay. So. Of course, there is a, probably a, a slightly um, a, a quicker hack as well, that you can just say, I am putting my glasses on the table, or I no, that's have right. locked the door. Yeah, that's right. Because you're actually paying attention. Yeah, you, that's yeah. right. And that's, a, yeah. that's using more. That's so... So in our little self-alert hack, uh, the, the, the focus, pay attention, was exactly that. It was a, that was activating the left frontal lobe of the brain, which is involved in the attentional set. So you're right. You were using one brain system to aid that and using another brain system to increase noradrenaline levels so that that memory would be even more strongly. Because noradrenaline fixes memories in, in the brain better. So you're right. There was a, so you can use a combination of hacks like that. Yeah, just yeah. To, to remember where everything is. Does yeah. anybody have any questions for Ian in the audience? If you do, throw up your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Um, you mentioned there, I mean, you're talking about different parts of the brain as well, Ian. Yeah. And I know we hear a lot about left brain and right brain stuff. That has suffered a bit of a kind of a <coughs> slightly dodgy reputation in recent years, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Maybe uh, not, not deserved either. So. Yes, I, I think it was probably not deserved, like all like all things in, in psychology. So I'll remember you've got a question, so okay. give your arm a rest, and then I'll, I'll answer this, and then we'll come back to you. Um, uh, like all things in psychology, you know, there's an element of truth to it. It gets taken too far by popularizers, and then the baby gets thrown out with the bath, bath water. The same thing's happening with brain training at the moment. I can talk about that later if you want. But um, uh, the fact is, the two halves of our brain do different things, but they usually most, most mental activities use both part of the brain. So um, 
but, but it is true that the left half of the brain is more associated with verbal, analytic, logical thinking. It's also more associated with uh, setting goals and going forward to achieve goals. And it's more associated with positive mood, whereas the right hemisphere of the brain is more associated as more um, diffuse, uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, how shall we say it, uh, Associative kind of thinking, rather Seeing than logic. Patterns between things. Yeah, that that's right. Maybe thing. things that don't obviously have mm -hmm. patterns. It it um, it's much more the it's, it's more much more involved in self monitoring and self awareness. It's much more involved in anticipating risk and um, uh, avoiding uh, danger. And you know, when they're in balance, the two sides of the brain are, are just perfect, brother and sister. Mm -hmm. You know, to to because you need all of these functions to work. And also, there's certain type of problems uh, called, for instance, insight problems that, that are very difficult to solve um, with verbal and logical analytic skills, which have been shown to, to need the right hemispheres, kind of loose associative processes. So, I'll get, I'll get, can I give you one? one? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, the, the damsel is trapped in the tower um, 40 feet above the ground. and um, she uh, has a 20-foot rope in the in a room, so she cuts it and gets to the ground. How does she do it? Anybody got an answer for that one? Splits the, splits the rope down the middle. There, there's a woman with yep. a splendid right hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she cuts, cuts it up the middle Ties of the rope. Think, uh, she cuts it up the half longitudinally. Um, and then ties them together and says a 40 foot rope. You didn't tell us it was a darn thick rope. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was the key. There was a lady up here with a question. Yeah. I think. We have to wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, I just want to ask a question when you were talking about attention span earlier. Um, I recently finished studying and I realized myself that my attention when I was in a library, when there are a lot of people around, was, um, wasn't as high as when I was on my own. And I recently started in an office, and it's an open plan office, and there's people buzzing around all the time and computers. Yeah. So I was wondering, was there any tests that you've done or any tests that you know of when they talk about attention span in an open plan office versus what traditionally was there when everyone was separated? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, can I just say that your experience is perfectly normal, and there's thousands of experiments in psychology showing that your reaction is normal, but it's very, very hard to uh, resist uh, distraction. Some people are better that, at it than others, and yes, there are tests that show you uh, there's three basic types of attention. There's sustained attention, which is what the SART measures. There's attentional switching, which is being able to switch from different uh, concepts are different, for, me, for instance, from one language to a different language to thinking about one thing to another. And then there's attentional selection, which is what you're talking about, being able to select one stream of information and uh, avoid, exclude the other. And the, that, the, that last one is more linked to the uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the brain. And um, it's, uh, but we all have, we're all, uh, different degrees of ability to screen out I irrelevant noise like that. So here's the good news. Uh, the, we, people who have a traumatic brain injuries, and indeed older people, have particular difficulties with this. So we did a, a piece of research with um, uh, uh, people with traumatic brain injury. And what we did was, we started off, we played them uh, two different stories, one to each year. But well, we started off just playing them one story, and the other one was down at zero volume. And we got them to answer questions afterwards about the story, and they answered it quite well. We then got them the other sto a different story competing in the other year at 25% of the volume of the other one, and got them to do that. And then we upped it till eventually they were doing it with 100% competing a uh, different story in, in one year. And what we found was people could improve. If, when they practiced this, they got better at doing so. 
and that change, we, we could measure differences in their attention, but also in the EEG, uh, the electric reticular activity of the brain. <coughs> and I met one of the people who had done it, a, a chap who had a severe brain injury, and he was, he was saying he would be sitting in the garden with his sister, uh, who had not had a brain injury, and there was a car alarm going off in the background, beep, 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 and she was getting really distressed because, you know, it was distracting her. And um, he said, it didn't bother me at all. Previously, it would have driven him mad, but he had learned to screen out. So uh, you could do a similar training program to yourself. You can train yourself to um, gradually to <laughs> ignore, you know, uh, and would it happen naturally over time anyway? If, if, if this lady were, if you were working in the office for six months, might you find, oh, I've, I've kind of learned how to do that? So it, maybe and maybe not. The okay. problem is, because the, the problem is you get these, these um, feedback cycles where you, you go in expecting to be distracted. Yes. You get kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, does this make sense? And you get kind of tense, kind of, and that, that then becomes a, a kind of additional load in your working memory. Okay. Which, which further depletes your ability to concentrate. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, um, you, you know, it's, it's this question of you have to break that cycle. The other thing, I don't know whether you can, are you allowed to put earphones on and play music? Are you allowed to do that? You know? I've seen it yet. <laughs> yeah, because it's, I mean, open plan offices are, are just really, really bad if you don't shield that and you're you're not abnormal you're completely normal and and your 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 cognitive your productivity will be reduced by that by too much and it's funny because yeah. I, yeah. I have um i i work at home a lot and I, yeah. I have other friends who do and um i have friends who actually have apps that simulate the sound of a cafe that they put on yeah. while they're working yeah. because they're they're, they're t it's too quiet yeah. for them. yeah no that's just such a lovely oh, these are great questions you're great yes. so all of the brains, not all of them, the, many of the brain's key chemical messengers have an inverted U-shaped function where too little and you underperform and too much and you underperform and there's a sweet spot in the middle. The original title of the book was The Sweet Spot. And that's true of noradrenaline, it's true of dopamine. And um, so in your friend's case, uh, what they were doing was changing the environment to control their brain chemistry by a bit of uh, background, background noise that lifts, that lifts their arousal sufficiently, actually making it easier for them to, to, to keep their attentional focus. They were giving themselves the equivalent of a little pill. Uh, the, the opposite happened, when people get, so what can, the risk is if you get stressed and irritated by trying to avoid the distraction is you're, you're being tipped over the other side of the curve where there's too much noradrenaline and it's interfering with the cognitive function. So the, the challenge there is, to, is to, to, to kind of relax and enjoy it and, 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 and find ways of screening. So just feeling you have a little bit of control. So control is the essence of uh, uh, both attention, uh, of, of, of attention's effects and emotion. So if you can gain a little bit of a sense of control even though there is no objective control that you have, if you can feel you can control your response to that stressor, that sense of control will make you better able to do that. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so I, I think uh, if, if you practice, do a bit of practice, uh, maybe reading you know, with a bit of radio, spoken radio on the background, just practice doing that a bit, you can, you can tune up and train that attention system and once you feel more in control, you'll be less distracted by the noise surrounding you. I suppose everybody's different as well. In my case, uh, my kids always know when I'm about to park the car because I turn off the radio. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But like that, I suppose, uh, and, and this is something I, I kind of blame Isaac Newton for this because he's dead and he can't come after me. But I think we tend to think of that as a, as a linear thing. Or there's kind of a, you know, uh, if a little bit is good, a lot of it yeah. is better. Or yeah. there's kind of everybody yeah. fits this line. That's right. But of course, we're, we're biological. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. all about sort of... Well shaped curves yeah. and everything. So yeah, yeah. maybe we can talk a little bit later about how to how to get to that sweet yeah. spot, I suppose. Anybody yeah. anybody got any other questions? There's somebody over here, I think. If you just wait for the wait for the Thank microphone you. to come down to you. 
Um, yeah, you were saying earlier that uh, the brain has a negative bias. Yeah. I, I was just wondering, is that <coughs> negative bias, is it something that's inherent in us, or will some people have uh, a positive bias? Um, it's a good question. Um, here's the good news. Uh, the older you get, the more of a positive bias your brain gets. So peop and, and That's good news. Yeah. Um, so people of my age tend are on average much happier than most of you young folks <laughs> here. Um, we, we tend to pay attention to positive things over negative things. We tend to remember positive things over negative things. And that paying attention and that uh, remembering of positive things lifts our mood. Um, so that, and whether that's because of our brain, slight brain decay, or whether we're all too aware of the short, you know, the shortening span on this planet, um, uh, means we're saying we're going to make the most of it, I don't know. But, um, uh, so, so yes, you can have a positive bias. And it's possible to train your brain to have a positive bias. So there are various very clever psychological training methods. Uh, because people who are very anxious, for instance, particularly phobic about a particular thing, they will, their, 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 um, their attention system works like a kind of interception missile and will seek out negative things, negative words. They'll go to the negative word or the word associated with the phobia over the positive one. You can actually short circuit that and train them to, you know, even unconsciously to start paying attention to positive things. So, and, and the, the trouble about the negative bias is if you, to the extent that you're oriented towards remembering negative things or, or, or anticipating negative things, that makes it harder to remember positive things. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the competition between the two halves of the brain. And so it's a kind of posi positive, malign feedback loop. The, and and the, incidentally, this happened in the, the, coming up to the crash of 2008 with all the million, with particularly bankers and financial traders. They were so oriented towards positive bias of both in their memories and what they were attending to. The, the whole capacity of the right brain to remember negative things and past crashes and anticipate future risks was diminished as well as along with self-awareness. And so it was a complete imbalance of the brain that way. So we can, we can rebalance our brains to the extent that we rebalance them. We can get to a, not a 100% positive bias because that's probably unrealistic but um, you know, and not desirable I, I, to a point where there's more of a balance and you can do that. So it just strikes me, um, if it, uh, just a matter of interest, if, people, if, if you're ever buying things online or if you're kind of looking for a place to stay, do you tend to look for the, do you tend to read the five star reviews or the one star reviews? Who's the five star, who That's are the five star question. readers? And who are the one star readers? I'm a one star reader. <laughs> um, so I mean, if, if, can we change things like that? I'm like, a five you know, star. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a five star. Yes. That's a great, I'm going to steal that question. Go for it. Steal that question. <laughs> That's a brilliant question. And if you, if you yeah, change your yeah. habits, if, if I suddenly kind of, instead of looking for all the things that could go horribly wrong, if you suddenly start going, I'll read, read what works for people. So there's no behavior that cannot be changed. There's no, be even, even where there's a disease, pro a genuine disease process, the brain is so plastic and so complicated, there is no behavior over which potentially you don't have some control, maybe not complete control. Um, and, but the trouble is, we have to believe you can have that control. And that's where the curse of genetic fatalism comes in. The, 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 and it turns out that the theories that we have about our abilities are hugely determined whether or not our, 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 our ability to cope with bad things does this, does this speak to the, the notion of growth mindset versus yeah. fixed? Yeah, so. a growth versus fixed mindset. This is not my word. This is the, uh, Carol Dweck, a wonderful psychologist at Stanford. And uh, so, you know, think, I, I'll ask you the question. I won't ask you to put up your hand. I mean, how many of you think that intelligence is fixed and really you're, is, you're endowed with it and there's nothing much you can do? So think yes or no to that. Um, how many of you think your personality is, and behavior is pretty much fixed? You can't do much about that. Um, 
to the extent that you have a fixed mindset, that you subscribe to these uh, beliefs about your mood or your personality, your intelligence, when you face a setback uh, in any of these domains, you're more likely to give up because, you're, because of your belief that it's fixed and out of your control. Um, and so, for instance, children who uh, get, a, you know, get the kind of exclusion that you get in the playground often in kids, the ones who hold a fixed mindset about their personality are more likely to withdraw and become more and more isolated, where the children who have a, a growth mindset, where they say, ah, it's a, com you know, basically my theory is it's a combination of how, what I'm like, what happens to me, who the people are, circumstance, chance, persistence, you know. People with that kind of growth mindset are more likely to say, Phew, they're a horrible bunch, I'll find some new friends and take the effort, and they end up not. Similarly with intelligence, if you, if you believe your intelligence is absolutely fixed, it's genetic, even if, you're, even if you believe you're very bright, telling a, telling a kid, they're, oh, you're really bright, is a, a really bad thing to do to them, because you're injecting a fixed mindset into them. And when that bright kid then uh, encounters, uh, can't do the algebra. Or Lucy fails an exam. Or Lucy fails an exam. Mm -hmm. It's catastrophe, because it's not just, oh, that was a hard exam, or that was a, an, that was a swine of an examiner to put that question in. It's, oh, maybe I'm not bright. So it becomes a threat to your ego. And even young children who hold such, they, they with the Carl Dweck show, and they withdraw. When they're faced, when they, when they don't manage to solve a problem, they go to, to close down mode, and they, they withdraw. And so they end up not progressing in their maths in their early uh, adolescence. Uh, as much as people with a, a, a fixed mindset, even if they're very bright, <laughs> objectively. Yeah. So the, the theory you have, and the same is true about our belief in controlling our, uh, changing our habits. Changing any habit is awful difficult. It's awful difficult. Think, about, think how long it took us to learn to ride a bike. Think how long it took us to learn to write. Think learning is slow and difficult, and it's also up and down. And you have to really believe that it's possible for you to change a habit and accept that if you fail one day, um, you're, 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 it doesn't mean you're just no good and it's what you have to give up. So that, that, it's, that, it's that faith in your ability to, to control your own brain and, and mind, that belief is essential precursor to actually engaging in the pain of learning. But yes, you can learn. And I'm, for instance, I'm terrible. I say, you know, I tried to learn the saxophone, and um, I, I, I kind of gave up, uh, you know, uh, because I kept thinking I didn't practice consistently. I always compared my, I didn't compare myself with how I did yesterday. I was kind of thinking, oh God, that sounds terrible. And I, I really did have this, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not really good at playing a musical instrument. Do you play any other musical instruments? No, I don't, and I wish I, wish I did. That's probably and a tough was, one. Yeah, and it was because it was because it because really I implicitly had a fixed mindset about it, I think, and didn't have the discipline to practice, you know. Nice, very interesting. Anybody got any other questions? This gentleman over here. If you just wait for the microphone to come down to you. I do also want to ask you about your process of discovery, Ian. I think that, that's a, a, a really interesting theme through the book, but first of all. Yeah. Good evening, Ian. Um, my question is regarding being left-handed. I'm part of a minority. And I'm just wondering, is the wiring of our motherboard slightly different? And does it preclude or does it give us an advantage to certain endeavours? Great question. The answer is probably not. Um, most left-handed people are still left-brain dominant for language. It's only a minority where it's completely crossed over. And there's so few of them, we don't really know enough about them. So most of the stuff um, we're talking about probably applies to you, depending on whether you, how, how completely switched your brain is. Um, the left-handers, if God forbid you were to have a stroke, uh, do seem to recover a bit more readily because the because of the mixed the dominance, the the brain can compensate a bit better. So, so that's one of the upsides. But. Um, Generally, uh, there wouldn't be that much difference, except if you're one of these very extreme ones, which I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Anybody else? Lady here in the front, if you just wait for the 
the mic to come down. So we've time for just a couple more questions. Thank you. You mentioned in your book a fascinating idea about um, squeezing a ball in your right hand yeah. to try and waken up your left hand side of your brain. And I don't know, I, th I think you were going to talk about the left and right brain earlier and you m yeah. might like to go on because I thought your story about the the powerful and the less powerful students and yeah. Banging, yeah. banging into the corridor is brilliant. Yeah. But, but I just want to ask you, any ideas about how long somebody should squeeze a ball? For well, it's a very practical question. Very practical question. Well, look, uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, the, the, the studies that were done on this, the, it, was, it wasn't hard squeezing. It was 45 seconds on, 15 seconds on, 45 seconds on, 15 seconds on. Not, not forever, but for a, a few minutes before you're having to do something tough. Uh, and I do it all the time. Can you just explain to everybody what, what that does? So, what that does is it activates the left frontal lobe of the brain because of the cross connections in the brain. And as I said earlier, the left half of the brain is, 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 it tends to be more in approach mode. It's, a part of the, it's more associated with the, the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is part of the reward network. And it's essentially it's a system which is about going forward and anticipating reward and action and moving forward. The right hemisphere of the brain is more associated with noradrenaline and it's more associated with anticipating punishment. And uh, it just makes you hang back. It makes you hang back. And, and that's why the self-awareness, self-monitoring, what's going on here, what are they thinking about me? And you need these two systems. You don't want them to be out of balance. But sometimes, often, in people with you know, a lot of anxiety and um, social anxiety, for instance, there'll be, and even in babies who, have, who are socially anxious or, or, or anxious tend to have more right hemisphere activation uh, than left. But you can, you, can, you, can tilt, you can help the brain redress that balance, balance by a few things. One of them is that uh, just surreptitiously squeezing your right hand. The other is by posture, because posture, um, uh, if, you, if you adopt a so-called power pose, uh, you can trick your brain into thinking you're Give very us a confident. Power pose there, Ian. Yes, power pose. Hey. <laughs> I can feel the brain chemistry. <laughs> that increases testosterone, watch out. And, uh, and um, increases testosterone, which in turn increases dopamine. Dopamine, the reward network of the brain, the feel good network, is a natural antidepressant, anti anxiety drug. So by a combination of posture, squeezing your right hand, saying, I feel excited before a difficult presentation or meeting, you can tilt your brain into uh, and help strengthen the, the left hemisphere approach uh, mode. And um, so uh, you, you, I wish I had a video to show you here of the, the, the recent uh, European Cup, uh, the shootout, penalty shootout between Germany and Italy. Um, the goalkeepers will under pressure, that is, they're a goal down in the penalty shootout, will about 70% of the time dive to the right. Why? Because they're desperately wanting to save it. Their approach mode of their brain is switched on fully, and that tilts them slightly to the right. Powerlessness, feeling powerless, even by thinking of a time when someone had power over you, when you're powerless, uh, say in an interview or an appraisal, uh, tends to activate the right front part of your brain and tilt you slightly leftwards. Great, that's an excellent question. Um, I did. Want, um, there's a gentleman with a question here. Just while you're waiting, just while you're waiting for the mic, I just did want to ask you about yeah. that process of discovery. As I mentioned yeah. during the book, it struck me that a lot of the time you uh, you have an insight, a moment of insight, when you think about something that's happened to a patient, where yeah. something has gone wrong with the, with the brain system, yeah. or you see a quotation or something like that. I mean, is it just a case of fortune favours the prepared mind, or do you consciously sort of look out for things? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a great question. I just wish I'd had these insights at the time. Right. Here am I, the, you know, the privilege of being an academic and being able to read. It's just, there is so much amazing research out there. And there's really very, very few people who have both been a practicing clinical psychologist and who, who are who are accessing all this amazing literature. This is the, the tragedy of, you know, of, of science, is, is how do you translate it? 
And unfortunately, the main vehicle for translating is through the pharmaceutical industry uh, because they have the money and, and, you know, and the momentum and the, and the mechanisms to do it. But we don't have the equivalent for translating psychological findings mm -hmm. into. And so it's, 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 it's thinking about these poor people I was, you know, some of whom I helped, some of whom I didn't, and thinking, oh, God, that's what I... You know, reading, reading some of these brilliant experiments and saying, geez, oh, if I'd only thought uh, to do that. Now, I had success with some using the, the methods that were known then. But we could do so much better, but we don't, we don't have a good connection between all this cognitive neuroscience that's going on and the clinical practice of psychotherapy and behavior therapy that's going on. We don't have a good connection. There is some good research, but uh, a lot of this kind of most therapists are disconnected from that. That's why we need more people like you who do both. Yeah. Um, gentleman here. Uh, just a quick question. What makes the brain laugh? As in, like, what's the chemistry that makes uh, us laugh? Do we know yet? I don't think we know. I, I, honestly, that's a great question. And I, I'm not going to pretend I know the answer to that. Um, I do. I, I, and the only knowledge I have of that was a program the other night uh, with, uh, Sophie Scott, was it? Uh, with Sophie Scott. Sophie Scott. If you look up so Google Sophie Scott, yeah. I think yeah. is she in UCL? I could be she's getting. She's in UCL. UCL. She's done a lot of research in yeah. that area, and she's yeah. very engaging, actually. She's. And also, my knowledge here is from that program, <laughs> where, <laughs> where apparently, apparently, laughter is a kind of social bonding. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, um, according to, to Robin um, Dunbar, it's a kind of preening. It's what is mon monkeys, his theory is the monkeys and, and primates um, groom each other one to one, and that's a way of building social bonds. And that grooming increases the social bonding hormone, which is oxytocin. His theory is that laughter is the equivalent in humans, and it's so effect and humans are such an effective group species because laughter isn't one to one. You can spread to a whole group, and you can get a whole group laughing all their oxytocin levels going up, and that creates a social bonding. Now, that's, that's me gleaned from good science television, not from any <laughs> knowledge of my own. Yeah. Very good. Well, we are running out of time, and Ian will be here uh, to sign copies of the book and to answer your questions individually. I suppose just to round off, Ian, we talked about that, that U-shaped curve yeah. and, and where you probably want to be in the middle somewhere. So what would your top tips be to keep your brain in that sweet spot for managing things like stress and attention, memory? People with no stress in their lives do as badly as people with high levels of stress, of adversity. A bit of adversity keeps us in the sweet spot. If you suffer from chronic back pain, if you have no very little adversity in your past life, you're much more likely to be disabled and off work, much more likely to be taking painkiller medication, you're more likely to be depressed. So a Tough times happen to everyone. Um, and it's a question, uh, very tough times are I'm not advocating very tough times for people. But for instance, older people with fragile memory who suffer some stress, for instance, even the serious illness of a spouse in the 70s, maintain their cognitive function better because of the, st the stress pushes them up into that sweet spot. So I what I would say about keeping your brain is embrace Prob embrace problems and stresses as a challenge. See them as a challenge, not as a threat. If you see them as a challenge, that will activate the brain's approach system and will be a natural antidepressant and anti-anxiety and confidence-enhancing stance to take. Great. Well, wonderful words of advice. And as I say, Ian will be here to sign the book uh, for a little while. And uh, in the meantime, thank you so much, Ian. It's thanks been a pleasure. Thanks very much, Claire.